So I hope it will be okay. And uh, that's all. So uh, have a, a good uh, good day and uh, see you after the, the talk. Thank you. Here we go.
Try to give a talk. It's me, David, your robot. Enjoy the technology. I will wake you when it is over. Since Cactaceae were first known, we tried to classify species for a better understanding of this family. This was done under morphological criteria. The huge complexity of the family, 
the innumerable interactions between taxa, pollinating and dispersing animals. The extreme diversity of their habitats mean that the classification of Cactaceae is much more difficult to undertake than might have been thought at the beginning of their study. Over the centuries, the number of species discovered has been increasing, and since the 20s with the four Cactaceae volumes of Britain and Rose, then towards the 50s, with the Cactus Lexicon of Backburg. A plethora of taxa emerged with more and more explorers describing the same species and genera they had found, with different names. Exaggerating differences in taxa encountered became more important than their similarities. This extreme separation of taxonomic entities is known as splitting and we must admit, led to an immoderate creation of genera and species. Soon, given the strong differences between authors, another kind of classification appeared again, the lumping, that is to say, regrouping genera within only one. As occurred with the supergnus, a puncha. <laughs> Trying to slow down the apparent abundance of taxa in both genera and species over the past two decades, Two major reference books were published, one in 2001, The Cactus Family, by the late Anderson, the other in 2006, The New Cactus Lexicon, by Hunt. Based on the meetings of the IOS Working Party Group and the International Cactaceae Systematics Group, Developed in the framework of the International Organization for Succulent Plant Study Consensus, the new Cactus Lexicon proposed a taxonomy that holds 127 genera, 1,438 species, and 378 subspecies. In fact, both books attempted to synthesize the Cactaceae family, deleting or combining many genera and species, under the simple criteria and always subjective in botany, that there would be fewer differences between these taxa, than analogies. The changes are simply subjected to a vote at meetings, and to paraphrase Johann Pott, is a specialist in cell corpusha, for example, automatically qualified to vote for or against the taxa included in mammillaria, and if specialists of mammillarias can give their arguments for possible changes in the genus Apuncha, is it sufficient reason to vote for or against the genus they have not studied? Finally, what is the criteria that is used to determine the validity of a particular taxon? One person has usually led all others in his choice, because he was designated as being more qualified. Moreover, most of changes were virtually made with no explanation. Finally, should not be DNA studies a better, more objective system? The cleoptistic analysis of current use and based solely on morphological characters can lead and has led to misinterpretations, because the study ignored possible evolutionary convergences. Examples are many, the most fanciful proposal by Halda and Molina in 2005 certainly being, to include all species of the genus Pralia in Astrophyton, because they have both similar seeds and apical yellow flowers. Hasty reconstructions proposed or formalized in the new cactus lexicon are no better than pointing combinations or deletions of taxa by giving simple preferences. Denmoza escaped this appearance by 15 votes in favor, to 7 votes against. Cryptosaurus was sentenced on suspicion.
Echinophosulocactus was just disliked, etc. As my own brother Theory Lotte expressed in his latest work, Manifesto for an Evolutionary Ecology, evolution creates differences and allows diversity. <coughs> Lumping is therefore an aberration in the approach to the classification of cacti. It is not to say that splitting is better, but in order to get as most as possible monophyletic groups, according to the last molecular studies, some changes were necessary. Some synonymized genera had to be separated again and I will give here some examples. Enthusiasts who collect and cultivate plants of the Cactaceae family are completely lost in the taxonomic changes that have occurred over the last 20 years. Missing genera were regrouped, or resurrected according to authors, which was not really a reliable taxonomic consensus. The questions these thousands of amateurs who are finally the main users of these criteria were, why all these changes? What are they for? Is it really necessary? No explanation was done. We cheerfully entered an era of confusion. <laughs> In this useful cactophile life, if he follows the misadventures of nomenclature, the average amateur will change from between two to six or more times the planned names on labels, with little knowledge or understanding of the merits of whether these changes are needed. He is following the trend, and not what he believes to be the international decisions of botanical nomenclature. Most often, it is based on a personal preference, the cactus grower will be rather influenced by factors such as the name was on the label, literature purchased at that time, the possible influence of close friends and cactus amateurs, etc. All this means that it is often difficult to change a name because we have used it for years, even decades. Basically, we choose a personal classification, but we cannot say exactly why. In 1995, in an attempt to elucidate the phylogenetic of Cactaceae using molecular data, Wallace presented his first DNA studies of cacti at the IOS Congress in Mexico. Despite the results and confirmation of these results over the years, apart for the finally splitted genus Apuncia, DNA studies were not taken into account and only morphology and anatomy were the golden rules for grouping taxa. <coughs> After trying to regroup certain genera within Ariosis or Parodia for their simple morphological analogy, these genera were used to unnecessarily create subgenera, separating taxa with the same criteria that those used to precisely create these genera when they were valid. If they are not recognized, why make them subgenera? And if they are recognized, why not keep them as correct genera? After all, who is entitled to say that there are too many genera in the family, or on the contrary, that there are not enough? A rather long period of wait and see followed. From 2010, the trend was finally reversed and real changes in taxonomy began to appear in academic journals in the form of articles. Because the scientific studies carried out are not to change the taxonomy of cactaceae, but to understand their phylogeny and the relationship between different taxa, they also aim to attempt forming monophyletic groups, that is, groups sharing a common ancestor. Of course, reasons are given by lumpers to explain the wholesale rejection of molecular data results. One of these reasons is the number of molecular markers that appear to them to be insufficient and imprecise to obtain reliable results. But one also feels in this statement a kind of refusal to be questioned that would change their established order. Moreover, 
more molecular markers have been used for the most recent analysis. If they coincide with the morphological description of a genus, why not taking into account the results? Finally, what exactly is a real and rigorous botanical classification? Through constantly improved DNA research involving multiple nuclear markers with higher resolution, scientists have provided new data and opened the way for a more rational classification, taking into account parentage relationships. Unfortunately, most of the molecular studies were published in almost confidential, scientific journals to which very few people, and more specifically cactus amateurs have access so they were mainly ignored. Today, the vast majority of scientists believe that all life forms that are known are descended from a common ancestor. The descendants of this ancestor have become the descendants of new life forms, and so on until today. Cladistics is the method used in phylogenetic systematics to establish relationships between different forms of life, and classify clades, or groups of families. It is likely that this concept is nevertheless erroneous. According to Theory Laude, scientists do not know how the phenomenon of horizontal transfer is spread. Evolution can be horizontal and not follow the principle of descent. Increasingly, reticulate evolution is recognized, helping to understand the presence of intergeneric hybrids and the consequent difficulties in the classification of cacti. With molecular phylogenetic study however, the science of taxonomy has entered a new era. One of the families, whose taxonomy is probably the most controversial, Cactaceae, is in a crucial phase where the concept of genus is now based on works based on the extraction of DNA, and then reading data that are interpreted from scientific results. Answers should therefore be clear. The cladograms obtained reflect the phylogenetic history and the relationships between different taxa studied and regroups them into clades. Thus, the classification obtained does not automatically separate the genera and species, that would be too simple. It is more of a tool used by trained biologists to guide their choices and arrive at a classification that is logical, practical and understandable. This leaves us less involved in subjective misinterpretations, However, data from DNA sequences are not and will not result in a final classification of cacti. They only provide additional characters for which phylogenies can be reconstructed. They do not always take into account the phenomena of hybridization in nature, horizontal transfer, the so-called reticular evolution, species that may arise, because nature is much more complex than it looks which requires the use of nuclear DNA sequences in the classification. But they still helped us realize that we were wrong in our approach to the classification, and the features used. For example diurnal flowers against nocturnal plants. With or without cephalium. Globular against columnar body. Etc. could in fact have evolved separately or in parallel, and the convergence of forms does not necessarily indicate any relationship between two species. Phylogenetic studies can lead to dividing a genus into two or more genera. Plants of the group are divided into distinct genera and some then change name. This type of change in the nomenclature occurs when the result of a phylogenetic study shows that the initial genus is polyphyletic, 
that is to say, when all plants in the group are not descended from a single common ancestor that would be the basis of the group, individuals have different ancestors within the group, which means that the common ancestor of some plants of the group is outside the group. Therefore, it follows that the genus should be split into as many groups as there are original ancestors in the initial group, to form a phyletic genera. Since 1993, David Hunt, and a few others after him, have consolidated Trabusha, Selcorbusha, Cincha and White Garsha, small globular cacti from South America into a single genus named Rabusha. Published in 2007, a genetic study of Ritz showed that this combination is not valid and according to their cladogram, the current genus Rabusha must be split into several distinct genera. However, Selcorbusha, Cincha and White Garsha are descended from a common ancestor and are clearly imbricated, thus they must be lumped within the oldest available name, which is White Garsha. Finally, instead of one supergenus Rabusha, three genera appear. Rabusha sensu stricto, Alastera, including Mediolobivia, White Garsha, including Selcorbusha and Cincha. Three genera have now disappeared, Mediolobivia, Selcorbusha and Cincha. We are getting closer to the reality, without an excessive splitting, or excessive lumping. Since, more molecular studies confirmed those of Ritz, Henschel and Augustin, 2008, Mosti et al. 2011, Schlumpberger and Renner, 2012. <coughs> In 2012, regarding the monophily of Echinopsis, Schlumpberger and Renner wrote, a monophyletic echinopsis would need to include Achaeans focalyceum, Arthrocerus, Cephaloclystocactus, Clystocactus, including Berzicactus, Denmosa, Ispostoa, including Vatricania, Hagiocerus, Harigia, Madocana, Mila, Oreocerus, Oroya, Pygmiosaurus, Raosaurus, Samapatosaurus, Weberbiosaurus, and Youngasosaurus, all of which are part of a well-supported clad, 100% bootstrap support interspersed with species of Echinopsis sensulato. Curiously enough, if Schlumpberger and Renner do not offer this extreme solution, they went even more against the current of lumping, and according to their cladogram, did exactly the opposite, splitting the genus Echinopsis into several genera that had been abandoned. Chimesaurus, Leucosto, Sorensia, Lobivia, Trichosaurus. Finally, being a splitter, is not only agreeing to separate taxa into several smaller entities, it is also recognizing the biodiversity. However, the following year, Ansuski and Magli do not hesitate to follow Schlumpberger and Renner's as such, regrouping within Echinopsis, genera like Clystocactus, Vatricania, Oreocerus, Weberbiosaurus, Hagiosaurus, etc. A real work of lumpers. Nevertheless, I would say, why always go looping for extremes? In 1996, Kota and Wallace confirmed the basal position of Morangaya in relation to Echinocerus, reconfirmed in 2001 by Wallace and Gibson. However, in 2006, Ten years after the first confirmation by chloroplast DNA, the new cactus lexicon authors continued to consider the genus Morangaya as Echinocerus pensilis, and generally continued to ignore 
event nowadays, the already very advanced molecular phylogenetic results, while new studies in 2011 confirmed the first ones, that is to say, Moragaya is not an Agynosaurus. In the new cactus lexicon, Urza cactus is placed within Clystocactus, pending as it is said, the emergence of an acceptable DNA-based classification of tribe Trichosauria as a whole. The actual phylogenetic data demonstrate that it is a mistake. Urza cactus, as well as Loxanthosaurus, should be considered a valid genus. The DNA sequences suggest that floral adaptations had been made in a convergent, but independent way within the main clades, also in Hagiosaurus and Loxanthosaurus. The molecular studies of Arakaki et al. 2002, 2003, 2006 confirmed the exclusion of Rizicactus and Loxanthosaurus from Clystocactus and the recognition of Loxiosaurus as a well-defined genus situated outside of the tribe Trichosauria. The most complete work made on the genus Pereschia is that of Leuenberger, 1987. But since then, it has been discovered that Pereschia is a paraphyletic genus. The analyses of Niefeller, 2002, showed that Pereschia is basal within the Cactaceae, but does not form a monophyletic group. The molecular analyses of Butterworth and Wallace, 2005, define Pereschia as paraphyletic. Edwards et al. 2005 produced a work based on the analyses of DNA sequences and also found that Pereschia is paraphyletic to the rest of Cactaceae. For example, the only species living in Costa Rica, Pereschia like Nidiflora, is very distant from the type species, Pereschia aculeata in a basal clad that would oblige to split the genus into two. In 2008, Butterworth and Edwards confirmed that Pereschia is paraphyletic. Niefeller et al. 2008, then Niefeller and Egli 2010 showed in their work that Pereschia is paraphyletic and shall be split into two separate genera. Barsamas et al. 2011 confirmed both Clades in their study and did not take much account of the subject. In their molecular work, Hernandez Hernandez et al. 2011 also presented a paraphyletic Pereschia. After so many evidences and there are more, the genus Pereschia SS, southern species, is considered at present to be a good genus, but we awaited another and new genus for the northern species, which was finally created under the name Leuenbergeria in 2013. Here is another puzzle in the cactus taxonomy. Cochinia was first established in 1897 by a cather in Brindegi as a subgenus of Mammillaria. In 1899, F.A. Walton gave it the status of genus that was endorsed by Britain and Rose in their book The Cactaceae in 1923. Then, Hunt, 1981, and Luffy, 1995, reconsidered Cochinia as a subgenus of Mammillaria. Anderson, in the cactus family, 2001, took into account a personal communication from George Lindsay, specialist of the cacti from Baja California, and especially a molecular study of Butterworth, on the fact that Cochinia has to be removed from Mammillaria 
the DNA sequences showing them clearly apart. In 2004, Butterworth and Wallace performed a phylogenetic study which confirmed that in addition to the morphological differences flowers, there is a genetic difference between cochemia and mammillaria. Nevertheless, Hunt maintained his position in the new cactus lexicon and kept cochemia within mammillaria. In 2002, Butterworth wrote that Hunt denies that cochemia is a distinct genus, arguing that the ornithophilic flowers only present in cochemia are derived and only contradict the relationship of other members of the genus mammillaria. In 2005, Crozier wrote, our studies show that cochemia should be recognized as a distinctive genus. If we take into account the results of this study, cochemia, endemic to Baja California, may be considered as separate since mammillaria SL is not monophyletic. Moreover, phylogenetic studies by Hernandez Hernandez et al. 2011 confirmed that the genus Cochemia is independent from mammillaria and should be considered distinct. The most recent molecular analyzes, Vasquez Sanchez et al. 2013 are in the same direction. The authors propose to keep Cochemia separate from mammillaria. After so many evidences, we must conclude that Cochemia is not a mammillaria. In the cactus family, Anderson included the genus Nopalia in Apuncha, while in the new cactus lexicon, Hunt and Al treated them separately. The first investigations of the genus on the basis of molecular data were made by Dickey and Wallace 2001, then Wallace and Dickey 2002 and suggested that Apuncha sensuato is polyphyletic. In their molecular study, Griffith and Porter, 2009, found Nopalia embedded within a puncha, which was later confirmed by Niefeller and Egli, 2010. Hernandez Hernandez, 2011, presented a cladogram in which Nopalia forms a clad with a puncha. The fact that Nopalia shows a specialized floral morphology, pollination by hummingbirds, is unfortunately not enough to justify the maintenance of this genus, even at the level of subgenus, because it is strongly nested among a puncha. Mayure et al. 2012 quite recently defined the tribe Apuncheoida, 98 species of Apuncha study plus 9 species of Nopalia, 6 species of Consolia, 4 species of Tasingba and Brasilia Puncha Brasiliensis, confirming Consolia as a separate genus, but including Nopalia in Apuncha sensu stricto. Finally, Vasquez Sanchez et al. 2013 show a clad apuncha in which is embedded a puncha aubrey, which is a nopalia. Therefore, I think we have got enough evidences to include nopalia in the genus apuncha. <laughs> Echinocactus is a problematic genus. Despite an apparent homogeneity, Echinocactus is polyphyletic. The molecular data of Butterworth et al. 2002 confirmed the conclusion of Cota and Wallace 1997 of the fact that Echinocactus grissoni is more related to members of the Ferrocactus genus, especially Ferrocactus hystrix and Ferrocactus glaucescens, than the other species of the clad Echinocactus. The hypothesis of the hybrid origin for Echinocactus grissoni leaves little doubt. Molecular study is based on chloroplast DNA alone. As it is inherited from the mother plant, 
It is likely that we are in presence of a hybrid between Ferrocactus, Mother Plant, and Echinocactus. Of course, this hypothesis would be strengthened if the research is focused on other DNA markers, which would include the nucleus. So the expectation prevails, but we can already say that we are probably in a statement of reticulate evolution within the genus Echinocactus. All this does not preclude adding that if Echinocactus grissoni was a hybrid, it is now a separate species. Although we have identified possible links of relationship, its flowers and fruits make it morphologically closer to the genus Echinocactus, including Echinocactus polycephalus, than Ferrocactus. On the contrary, the seeds do not resemble those of Echinocactus polycephalus. Although at this time, it was possible to change its taxonomy and create a new genus for it, we still lack additional data to go further, so it was given to Echinocactus grissoni a kind of wait and see status. In 2011, in their respective molecular studies, Hernandez Hernandez et al. Barsanez et al. Then Vasquez Sanchez et al. In 2013 confirmed the basal position of Echinocactus grissoni separated from the rest of Echinocactus, which allowed me to think that a monotypic genus could be created, and was endorsed with the creation of the new genus Crohnlinia in 2014. If Echinocactus grissoni is not an Echinocactus nor a Ferrocactus, then we must change its name. However, Vasquez Sanchez et al. 2013 went even further and suggested that all types included in their clad of Ferrocactus, Glandulocactus, Leuchtenberga, Stenocactus, Echinocactus grissoni and Philocactus should be considered as Ferrocactus until new evidence is available. Echinocactus grissoni being in a basal situation, I propose that it can be considered a genus of its own. Cronlinia grissoni, thus avoiding an unfortunate amalgam and especially the problem of precedence, which would require to reinstall all taxa of these genera within Leuchtenbergia or Echinofossulocactus. Thus, I consider the genus Cronlinia as correct, although further researches remain to be made. It was really necessary to put the record straight, to consolidate all of the molecular work done to date, and to try and present a structure more in line with actual classification using all modern parameters, and not just morphology, by proposing a new taxonomy which comes closest to genetic reality. Now, thanks to molecular genetics, we know that the Canvocalyceum is not Echinopsis. A Barocactus is not Disocactus. Bacberga is not Pachycerus. Culmarinia is indeed Culmarinia and not Coryphantha. Cynthia is in fact a Wygarcia. Corinopuntia is not Grissonia. Echinomastis, Propart, is not Sclerocactus, and some Echinomastis are probably not Echinomastis either. Ariosis Laui is indeed Rimacactus Laui. Neoporteria is not Ariosis, neither is Pyrocactus. Selcorpusha is not even Rubusha but Wygarcia for nomenclature precedence. Trichocerus is not Echinopsis, etc., etc. In taxonomy of the Cactaceae, 177 genera are provisionally accepted and described, many were rehabilitated, 
Only two had to be created. Kronlinia and Lewinburgeria. There may still be some errors of interpretation, and I agree that all hasn't been resolved yet. More importantly, this time, every change is documented and explained. All known phylogenetic studies are cited, and this is the first compilation of its kind on the cacti to date. As everything is never entirely white or completely black, there is still a problem with molecular genetics, with the combination of sequence number for a full resolution, the number of taxa studied in the analysis, the actual samples chosen, and possible misidentifications are simply due to uncontrolled, hybridized material. However, there is no need to hurry and change your labels when you hear of a name change. If you do not accept the reasoning of botanists, why change the name? There are no rules of obligation for amateurs. As I say in my book, please, don't change the names you have on your labels, it is your basic reference. And although the name may be incorrect, in effect it may be valid. So, you can add the correct name to your original label, or whatever you want to name your plant. After all, plants don't care about all that story I told you, and maybe you too. Thank you for your attention.